The number one request that people send to me above anything else is, can I make a introductory video on hyperdimensional computing and can I make it as simplistic as possible? So this is the video for you if you're in that category. Uh, I'll provide simple explanation as to exactly what hyperdimensional computing is and then a simple code walkthrough uh, for you utilizing that simple example. Before we dive into what hyperdimensional computing is though, I think it's important to frame why hyperdimensional computing is necessary and why I think so many people are looking into it. And so the bottom line is, is when you break down all of the different elements of um, AI and neural networks, we know that there are improvements and enhancements that need to be made, right? If we look at AI compared to the human brain, there is a massive chasm that exists. We know that we can improve AI because we have a model of the human brain that is far improved from current elements of AI. And we have a gap as to how exactly do we get there. And part of solving that gap, when you break down these different elements, like all of the different elements of AI, what would be the individual element that we could improve on the most? I think most people settle on the tokenization mechanism for good reasons. <laughs> the tokenization mechanism is kind of the, like the least scientific part of AI at the moment. Uh, and for a lot of reasons, right? So essentially we're taking words and we are trying to develop a mechanism for an AI model to understand and read these words. These words are nothing but symbols. And these symbols each have individual meaning. Us as humans, we don't have universal meaning of these symbols. We have individual languages, etc. right? So we're starting with essentially symbols that no one agrees upon uh, already. Uh, and then we are um, giving that to AI. And so, when you think of this in terms of a photograph, essentially what we're doing, let's say that we start off with a concept and the, and the concept is cat. And then, and then so uh, we start off with this beautiful picture of cat, but then I have to put that into English. So then that becomes a little bit lossy, right? <laughs> like cat is not just inherently C-A-T. Um, so there's lossiness there. Uh, and then, but perhaps uh, the person, I, I'm speaking then to a person that uh, speaks Spanish. So then I need to translate uh, cat into gato. <laughs> and then so I need to uh, make it a little bit more lossy then, right? I'm not translating the actual cat, I'm translating C-A-T. Uh, and then we're going more, and then you can just see and, and, and imagine how this makes it more and more and more lossy, right? And then as we get to AI models, it gets even more lossy from there is the honest way that I can put it. So like if, let's say that um, putting cat into English reduces the lossiness by 20%. We, we have an image that is 80% as good as the original. If uh, by doing that, if I then tokenize it and give it to an, an AI model, uh, it, it like at the end, it's like between five and 15% of the original, maybe. <laughs> like to me, it's honestly, uh, I have a hard time understanding how AI models are able to actually utilize and produce NLP based off of the current tokenization processes because there's not enough dimensions involved in it. And that's where we get into this example of hyperdimensional computing, right? And then so let me frame this for you with an analogy. So you have a playroom full of toys. As long as you only have a few toys, it doesn't matter if your playroom doesn't have any structure to it. You can find your toys easily and it's all good. But what if you have 10,000 toys in your playroom? Or what if you have a million toys? Then you need some way to organize these toys. You could just take all the toys out and you could put them on a shelf and with no rules and that would be like one dimensional, right? Or you could put in a few rules and that would be tokenization, like maybe like bag of words, counting how often it appears in a sentence. Uh, maybe you throw in another, a few other rules. You're getting up to like four or five dimensions, right? Uh, different cat and dimensions in this instance being categories. But uh, this would still not be like the most organized when you're talking about like 10,000 or a million toys. If you wanted to find an individual toy, you'd still have a really hard time. So you begin to catalog 
all of the different attributes of the toys and you put these attributes into a database and then you have a tables within this database like color play type configuration number of players type of players type of hero types of weapons literally anything could be a table that is an attribute of a toy and then you could have thousands and thousands and thousands of these tables and then one day a scientist he invents a magic shelf it allows you to actually store your toys in these tables. You simply put your toy into a drawer and it magically is whisked to every table or every shelf space that it needs to be inside of the storage container. You can then query the storage container for only red toys and your new toy would be in the query if it's a red toy. It would also exist on every other shelf though that matches its attributes as well. If it's a dog toy, it would be there, etc. right? And all of these shelves would fit inside of your playroom. They would just fit inside of this magic box because the boxes would stack and they would fold into each other. Just fold, fold, fold the boxes, right? Uh, and this is dimensional space. It's essentially what we're utilizing for that and how that works. And then so that's an overall summation of hyperdimensional computing in a nutshell, right? Going back to the initial example of cat, let's whereas tokenization gives you, let's say, five, ten, there's some that will even go up to like 50 or 100 dimensions of, of cat, right? Uh, but with hyperdimensional computing, we're talking about 10,000, a million, it's like, like every attribute possible that could ever make up the definition of cat. And that's what, what goes into this and why it's so powerful, right? Why, why people love this system so much. You're always like uh, compared to the original. <laughs> and this goes back to like, like, like uh, uh, platonic forms, right? If we have the platonic form of cat, and that would be 100% cat. Whatever we do with this is not going to equal 100% cat, right? But with hyperdimensional computing, we could get to like 99% cat. Whereas with current tokenization, we're getting 5 to 15% cat. So it, it's major leaps forward in that instance and in regards towards representations of these systems, right? And then so let's dive into what this looks like on a code level and dive into this very simplistically in Python. And so each toy is represented as a random high dimensional vector. And we're going to use NumPy for simplicity. And the vector space, we're going to use 10,000 dimensions, ensures that each toy and its attributes has a unique representation. So the first thing that we do is we import NumPy, and then we create a function to create our high dimensional vector. So uh, we create the function, it's random vector, uh, and then we're setting the dimensions. And then remember, dimensions are 10,000. And then there we go. And then our vector is just very straightforward, right? Minus one plus one. And then we create random high dimensional vectors for each attribute. And then so in this instance, we're just adding random attributes. We could, this, this attribute table could be 10,000, a million attributes long. And this is where you start getting into those big tables, right? But this is just simple tables for you for simplicity's sake. So these act as our magic labels or the shells. Each one of these individual tables is the individual shelf within the box. And then so uh, we, through dimensionality, can add more unlimited shells into this box. Like this magic box just holds more and more and more and the capacity increases as we add more into it. So in this instance, we have red, blue, action figure, hero, or vehicle, and then a toy. And in this instance, we're gonna be querying for a red hero action figure is represented by binding and bundling its attributes. We use element-wise multiplication, so the binding, to create unique representations and addition, the bundling, to combine attributes. And then, so this is where it gets into linear algebra. So we essentially, we take these attributes and then we turn them into a linear algebraic equation, flat out. We make them variables, right? And then we put the variables into to the, the equation. So we create the function to encode a toy by encode, combining its attributes, the variables. So define the function of encode toy. And then our vectors, in this instance, the vector that we created before, we're putting the numbers, the attributes in, filling those numbers, 
for the attributes and then telling them what they are. In this instance, we want, we're utilizing uh, element-wise multiplication. <laughs> Very simplistically, uh, when we utilize this as an example and we're actually like looking at these variables, so we would query red hero action figure uh, and then we would query it based off of the attributes, based off of these individual variables that we're putting in here, right? So red, hero, and action figure. And all of these would be individual attributes or individual variables that we're putting into the linear algebraic equation. And then we store all of these toys in a database, which is that list of vectors that we're creating. So we created the vector and then we're creating more and more and more vectors to find the toys matching our query. In this instance, our query is red. And then we compute the cosine similarity between the query vector and all of the stored vectors. So essentially, we solve the algebraic equation. That's all we're doing, right? So here it is. We break all of this down. We actually make it into a real algebraic equation. We take our variables, and then in our variables, see vector one, vector two, which are red and hero, and then we are putting those in here, so then we get, we're querying the red action hero table, <laughs> and when you put all of that together, and then we get our result, right? And then so we're querying all of the toys that exist for red action heroes, and then we query, in this instance, for red toys. We break that query down further. We only want, in this instance, all toys that match red. And then in this instance, we don't have anything in our database tables to bring back, so it queries no result. But that's the full summation there, full breakdown of what this looks like for you in code. And this is utilizing our toy box example, right? Our simple example of toy boxes and action heroes. And then so taking this one step further, what does this actually look like? Like what if we were to actually utilize this and plug this into a, an actual equation and actually graph it out? Here it is, right? And then so again, we're just, we're uh, in this instance and in the, in the end result, we're utilizing linear algebra and then we are encoding it into geometric space. <laughs> and so that's where it gets confusing, right? And then that's where like in this instance, you need to know uh, linear algebra geometry and then it gets into calculus and then so that's like when everyone tells you like why do you need these math like why do you need to know exactly these three here's why right because you're combining them you're taking linear algebra you're and then you're combining it and then you're plotting it out into geometric space flat out to me it's a pretty cool concept but here we go so you uh take and you create your random high dimensional vectors same thing in this instance our one minus one and then our dimensions of ten thousand and then we apply our math function so the cosine similarity function we encode we want to be able to uh combine all those attributes so look at them at once give it a way to like a lens to zoom and then we uh, want to be able to query the database for uh, similarities within that, right? So we're giving it kind of, it's, it's like, a, here's your Google algorithm. And then we uh, create the attributes. So again, red, blue, action hero, hero, vehicle. And then we could go up to 10,000 in this instance. And then if we wanted to go up to 100,000, we would increase that dimensions up to 100,000. And and every time that we do this, you're increasing computational complexity, right? It's going to be very hard to get a computer. My computer wouldn't, if you put 10,000 dimensions in here, you would burn up, my, my, my computer would catch on fire. <laughs> like, uh, so it, like, you are limited by compute, right? You can scale this up to infinity dimensions, but infinity is limited by compute power. There's, uh, and then that goes into physics as well, right? It all, everything boils down to physics. Uh, and then, so then we, step three, we encode some toys. And then, so uh, we have some toys in this instance. And then, so we're, we're going to actually like put some, some variables into our database. And then we're just putting some, like, uh, like three toys in there. And they're all, uh, two of them are going to look red and then blue. Uh, and then, so we're going to query for red toys. And then we uh, give our labels. And then in this instance, we have our toys. It brings back our query of our toys. And then we have uh, our query for red toys. And then in this instance, we're returning it into two dimensions, right? So dimension one, dimension two. And dimension one is toys. Dimension two is red query. <laughs> and then that's very simplistically how we're taking that algebraic equation and bringing it into geometric terms, right? So once you get past the math of it, like the, the, I mean, the confusing part of it, to me, this is very simplistic what you're doing. Like, I mean, this is basic beyond the math of it. <laughs> like the math of it is, 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 is a complex thing to set up in and of itself, but what the math is doing to me isn't complex. If you can just get past that part, 
this becomes easy to formalize. And then as an engineer, I like to reverse engineer and work backwards from there. And that becomes easier for me to learn this. And so hopefully this has been a good introduction to you for um, inter like uh, hyperdimensional computing. The next step is like how exactly do you get these into embeddings and how do you decode them, et cetera. And then so I'll dive deeper into that uh, for neural networks. But uh, I want to get out here. This is your very basic intro into hyperdimensional computing. Uh, if you like this type of content, please like and subscribe. Thanks very much.